Good afternoon, everyone. It's um, uh, wonderful to be speaking at the, um, towards the end of this summit. So, so many of the ideas of fellow speakers have informed what I'm um, going to talk to you about now. But I thought I'd start by just reminding us of what a cliche it is, um, especially in the UK at the moment, to say that we live in turbulent times. As Britain exits Europe, probably, maybe not, we don't know yet. We see a new, a new regime in Brazil. The US president is imagining walls being built between the US and Mexico. So there is political turbulence everywhere. Alongside is an expanded and often febrile social media environment and the populist polarization of political debate. This sits hand in hand with intergenerational and often identity-led clashes of values and mores. You could think of the Me Too campaigns, calls to decolonize collections, to restitute objects, and an increasingly confident, and I think very positive, um, multiplicity of um, protest, agency, and creative resistance on the part of the many who have not been at the heart of traditional power structures. So they're very interesting times, but not the easiest of times to be a museum director, I would say. It seems to me, um, looking at all of this, the public art museum, by which I mean an institution that has a statutory as well as a moral responsibility to be of and for the public, has a difficult but essential role to hold an open space for dissenting experiences of art and culture. This could entertain the utopian possibility that strangers might come together through the experience of art and agree that disagreement is possible and may be useful and is part of the conversation, a public conversation, about how we would like society to be. We might even change the world or at least our behaviours within it, as Tanya was saying. So rather than thinking that we live in difficult times where the liberal values of the arts are being trampled on, even though they are in some parts of the world, I think, at the moment, I want to reframe our context and suggest that we operate in necessarily sensitive times where we urgently need to cultivate better listening skills and more empathetic codes of engagement. The role, therefore, of the art museum is to create a space which is premised on an ethics of care for different people, different views and values and realities which can expand the practices by which people can engage with art. I think if we do this, we do justice to the nuance and complexity of art practice. And we also open up our spaces and histories to more than one story or view. We could, if we take care, become the many within our institutions. But there is significant challenge here because this should require us to go to the places and hear the ideas and views of those who do not want us. So we should not only be speaking to those who already like us or are open to the idea that art could mean something to them. We can't only see ourselves as the progressive guardians of all that is good and uplifting in a morally corrupt world. Because we are, of course, part of the problem, and we need to openly explore the profound exclusions and disagreements that are prevalent in our society that result in a situation like Brexit or the Brazilian election results. And without losing our own values, we need to hear the many other sides because now more than ever, we need to nurture spaces where disagreement, complexity and uncomfortableness can be constructively examined. Otherwise, I think we fail to hold on to the most useful thing about art, which is that it is fundamentally subjective and highly ambiguous. So, I came to Tate a little um, less than two years ago, inheriting an expanded institution that has been led by one of the most influential museum directors of our time. Under Nick's leadership, Tate's expansions changed the art world. For the UK, this meant making contemporary art um, much more a part of daily life. 
you know, more than eight million people every year come through the Four Tates, and millions more engage with us globally, online, and through our exhibitions all over the world. I would argue that expansion of Tate also made art seem less elitist and more conscious of its role in shaping the public sphere and public opinion. Your summit speaker last year, Olafur Eliasson, achieved that when the public took on the role of activating his weather project. They became the producers, co-producers of that artwork, and Tanya Bruguera very beautifully has been carrying that baton now as her turbine hall um, uh, work implements the construction of a new and different community of Tate neighbours. And I'm glad that she sees us as an organisation open to change. Tate also chose to change the art histories it told, focusing on becoming less white and Western, regendering the canon, exploring the other centres of art that have emerged across the globe through the 20th and 21st century. And this is certainly a key part of our future as we explore the meanings of historic collections formed through imperial might whilst we inhabit a post-colonial world and we think about the way art and artists shape debates about identity, power, and the politics of culture. So there has been lots going on at Tate. But in all of this, the significance of art for people, who gets to make it and who gets to shape the meanings attached to it, is probably our most critical question. It's one we've been exploring with the public in Tate Exchange, which has been unfolding as I'll go back there. Sorry, has been unfolding as an idea and a practice in for three year, roughly three years now in Tate Modern and also in Tate Liverpool. This project began with an idea about learning, I think, um, and about a floor in the Tate Modern building, but it has rapidly become a project about transforming people's relationship to art and to artists and about transforming the relationship many publics have with us as a national institution. So I might venture, in Tanya's terms, it is an implementation project, and she has been the artist in residence this year in um, uh, Tate Modern. And it's an ongoing experiment in changing ourselves as an institution. What it was um, set up to explore with the ways in which we could develop new kinds of engagement with more diverse communities um, and users. It aimed to generate debate around ideas in art that are relevant to issues today, and it was constructed as a platform, in gallery and online, on which other organisations, not just Tate, might undertake this work, and that is one of the critical issues. So it involves developing new practices, languages and ideas within the space of the museum, and in that sense is very resonant with many of the ideas that other speakers have explored over these two days. These other organisations are known as associates. There are 25 now at Tate Liverpool and 63 at Tate Modern. They range from small arts charities, such as the Museum of Homelessness or the artist collective Thicker Black Lines, which is based in Southwark, to very large organisations like the University of Plymouth or the Royal College of Art. Importantly, many are not from London, so it is an exercise in hearing across our country right now, something I think is very important. The structure is relatively simple. The diverse group of associates work with us to define a theme for a year. Um, it was um, movement whilst Tanya was with us. It is about to become love, another word that has been used by many of the other speakers. And the associates work to select a lead artist who doesn't do the work but is engaged with all the other associates. And the, these associates bring their ideas, their practices and their constituencies into the space and out into the world. It's been vital in shifting who comes to Tate, and I think that's an ongoing impact and project it will, um, it will do for us. And it has also changed who has a stake in making and shaping ideas within the organisation. 
So half a million people have come through Tate Exchange because it's open to the public, um, with many more participating online. And the ethos in that part of the building prompts new ways of encouraging public involvement, action, interaction, conversation. This is sometimes joyful. I have seen that many times in the Tate Exchange space, but it's just as often critical, even angry. So Tate Exchange has been a place where Tate has been shouted at, and that is also very important. So it's a deeper dig into what we can become together, and it is where we are as an organization learning to be open to critique and not feel too sensitive about it. So to give you a concrete, or at least a clay-based example, the artist before Tanya was Claire Toomey. She created the factory. This was the factory. It occupied the whole Tate Exchange space, 30-metre production line, eight tonnes of clay, um, a wall of drying racks, and ultimately over 2,000 fired clay objects that were made by the public and then shared and exchanged. Visitors were invited to clock in and learn the skills of working with clay, and they got to then exchange the objects they'd made for others that um, had been produced by other visitors, all in a factory setting. During the second week of Claire's residency, the production line stopped, and visitors were invited to enter a factory soundscape, join a tour to discuss how communities are built by collective labor, 6,000 visitors clocked in during that period, and they entered into an action and a dialogue about value and the production of art in a post-factory age. So it involved making and then thinking collectively and in public. And there was then a third stage, which leads us to these banners. Claire stepped out of the institutional space and went to the associates' locations. In particular, Valley Kids, who were based in the Welsh Valleys, um, um, in former mining communities. She went to City and Islington College, one of our further education colleges in London, and she went to Plymouth Art School. And in these settings, she worked with those constituents, labouring together towards a redefinition of the value of production in human terms. And these were the 12, 12 most frequent words. Claire didn't define the words for people, but these were the ones that emerged as the values that we need for now. They speak to me of a human-centered art engagement, and I think they direct us towards the words and values that we need if we are to hear the views of others. They were turned into big banners and brought back into the space so that further um, waves of visitors could encounter and engage and think about how these might help their thinking about art. Um, in Claire's words, she said, my practice as an artist is being shaped by this experience. She said, it isn't about art meeting society, it becomes society meeting art. And she said a great thing, crikey, she said, this is a big deal. She I don't doubt that what is happening in Tate Exchange will start to appear on the gallery walls because it is involved with thinking through the production of art. So very um, um, heartening and optimistic in these times. But what I want to finish by saying is that I would say most public institutions in the arts want to open up, share, extend, include, as public institutions, we don't sit outside society. In fact, we are very often the barometer of time and place. So Tate Exchange is one experiment in how to go about this opening up, um, making ourselves more open to change, and also moving dissenting voices from the edge to the center of our thinking. But this is not obvious or easy in complex times. As one participant said, art is an invitation to a conversation, and something like Tate Exchange can unlock that. However, as we do that, the kind of leadership that cultural institutions need has to shift. Um, if we are really to take on what Tanya called the implementation project. The first shift that I hope we will see from this 
would be in the demographics of who actually comes. Because um, in Jochen's terms, although we might very much wish for it, we are not the many in arts, arts institutions yet. We have for too long actually been with and speaking to the few. And projects like this have to be, if you like, um, an experiment towards shifting that further and faster. That also means we need to become more diverse organisations internally. And that is very easy to say and very difficult to achieve, at least at first. So we have got to challenge ourselves as organisations and be open to changing ourselves even as we are operating in public. So I wanted to share a thought that a colleague who is part of the Plus Tate network who work, works in a different part of the country said to me. She said, these past 12 months, it's as if someone has had their finger on the fast forward button. She's right, I think. And although it's very exciting and it's a change that I've wished for my whole life, it is also quite terrifying and often personally um, very challenging. We've no option, of course, to be part of it. We are in this terrain. But we should remember, I should remember, that the fast forward button is a gloriously analog metaphor for our times. Because you have to be my age or older, really, to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, my children don't know what I'm in that <laughs> noise that you got from putting your finger on the button. That doesn't happen with Spotify. And so the metaphor itself marks me as a little bit too old. And I, I, I would do well to remember that because we are talking about generational shifts and we need intergenerational thinking. So the ideas of those people who have grown up in a fully digital age um, need to lend us expertise to rethink the institutions we wish to be for the future. So. Even as I welcome these radical shifts in cultural authority and want to support them, um, they are very difficult when you are at the helm of an organisation like Tate. I think they are difficult for any leader at the moment. And I wanted to share that with you, because otherwise I feel I will not be living up to the honesty and self-examination that we need if we are to really explore the multiple truths of our time. And it's hard, of course, because changing anything um, and accepting that you have not always been doing the right thing means putting a head above the parapet and really beginning to address issues of power and privilege and control. So I, thi I find that most leaders of national cultural organisations just now, however sincere their own commitment to change and however radical their own background, will encounter some, but you are part of the problem. So I put my hand up to that. Certainly I have been told that and felt ve found it very strange to be accused of being part of the establishment when I feel that most of my career has been in opposition to this. But it's no good to defensively say that, um, look at my track record, I've always wanted this change. Instead, I think we have to say, we want to be part of this dialogue. We have knowledge to share here. What do we want to change? What does an art gallery need to do? And what can I do differently as a leader? This is part of working towards being a more representative and inclusive national institution. As Tristram Hunt, my colleague who took up his role within months of mine, um, he wrote last year that he thinks museums are not straightforwardly political tools, and they should not be, in his view. He said, but we do need to be safer spaces to explore unsafe ideas. I think this requires leadership with and through empathy. And this can feel very hard across 1,200 or so people at Tate, four sites, the triple challenges of commerce, cultural and artistic purpose, communities of stakeholders whose needs and wishes rarely ever clearly align. So it is about cultural leadership in the context of uncertainty. Focus, clarity, vision, the classic attributes of leadership are actually, if you think about it, all about being single-minded 
And I don't think single-minded is a very good thing if you want to lead in the context of complexity and wish for a multiplicity of voices, people, and stories to emerge. So our vulnerability is hard to hold to as a leadership value, but I think it's essential, an essential aspect of accepting that any organisation might not have all the right answers, nor will it always do the right things, but that stepping into an uncomfortable, risky place where failure is embraced as part of learning, and through this, becoming more diversely successful is not only important, it's non-negotiable if we want to be of our times. I think in the arts, more than anywhere, we have an obligation to create a larger space to think, act, and dream differently. Because that's what underpins all of the arts that we are all engaged in. Thank you. <laughs>